Europe is called the Old World. However, it is not because the continent is older than the others. The reason for that name is cultural, not geological. Europe is renowned for its splendid capitals and rich culture. We take for granted the European blend of antique, medieval, and ultra-modern architecture. In fact, it's the result of 3,000 years of history. In the process, new cities, whole empires, and civilizations have appeared and vanished. We rarely think about our origins, so let's go back some 10 centuries and consider the circumstances. There was no Moscow back then, no Berlin. Prague, Amsterdam, Brussels, Warsaw, and none of the northern capitals. In the year Christ was born, only nine of today's European capitals existed, and in 753 BC, anno urbis conditiae, the year that Romulus founded the Eternal City, only two of today's capitals could be found on the map of Europe: Athens and Sofia. My name is Terry. I was born in London. But I've lived here for about a decade. I am a Sofian. Sofia is my city. This city's European atmosphere, its Mediterranean spirit, makes me feel Celtic, Roman, Thracian, Hellenic. But above all, I feel cosmopolitan. Sofia is ancient, but it hasn't grown old. It's grown extremely wise, like the translation of its name from the Greek, God's wisdom. I've invited Maretta, a friend from Denmark, to visit Sofia. She arrives today. Most foreigners enter Sofia along Brussels Boulevard, which is named after one of the youngest European capitals. Sofia or Serdica is only about 1,700 years older than Brussels. During the Neolithic period, 5,000 years ago, there used to exist two settlements in place of today's Sofia. Later, the ancient town of Serdica appeared through the mists of time. In the fourth century BC, the Macedonian army of Philip II conquered Serdica. Later, Alexander the Great governed it as well. We find proof of the city's importance in the fact that Ptolemy mentioned it in his treatises in the first century AD. Serdica conformed to all the major requirements of a Roman city. What you're looking at here, the Decumanus Maximus, the main east-west road in Serdica. The legions marched along these stones with deadly battles with barbarians, and the Emperor Constantine marched back this way to his palace. I see you're talking about the Emperor Constantine. Who moved the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople? He lived here. That's right. Constantine the Great was in love with Serdica. Legend has it that he had the intention to set up the capital here. It's said that he once claimed, "Serdica is my Rome." So, these are the remains of the old palace complex. It's also known as the Quarter of Constantine. These strange tiles are actually part of the building's heating system. I mean, we're talking fifth century here. You know, when the Romans were thrown out of London by the hordes of barbarians coming from the east. Let me introduce you to the archaeologist Todor Chobanov. This is Moretta. Please, this way. Among the Roman emperors, Constantine was the most important for the development of Europe. In 313 AD, he issued the Edict of Milan, which stopped the persecution of Christians. 
Christianity became a recognized religion. Suddenly, the empire that had crucified Christ began spreading his religion. Constantine's favorite city became the seat of a bishop and one of the first cities in the world with Christian high officials. This is the oldest functioning church in Europe and one of the oldest in the world, the St. George Rotunda. It was already functioning in 326 AD when the Empress Helena found it and built a church on the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The church there was destroyed by the Muslims in 1009. The temple in Constantine's palace. It was built of red bricks at the beginning of the 4th century. There are five layers of frescoes preserved inside. The first one features images of flowers. It is a Byzantine layer from the 4th century. On top of it, there are three layers with Bulgarian frescoes. Angels from the 10th century form the ascension of Jesus from the 11th to the 12th century and a katitor, portrait of a bishop from the 14th century. The fifth layer features Ottoman designs from the time when the temple was used as a mosque. In Sofia, the town plans from Roman times are preserved even today. The Presidency building rises above Constantine's complex. Across the street is the building of the Council of Ministers. This remains the place where all power is concentrated. Next is Decumanus Maximus. Today, the main Roman road merges into the prestigious Bulgarian street, Vitosha. And where now stands the imposing Court of Justice building, there used to be the Roman Forum. Up until the 9th century, Serdica remained Roman or Byzantine. The Byzantine Empire is a literary concept. It was first used in Europe in the 16th century to denote the Eastern Roman Empire. Serdica first became a Bulgarian city in 809, during the rule of Khan Krum, and was renamed Sredets. It was from the Bulgarian lands that the most popular pre-Christian cults started, the cult of the horsemen, widely spread during the rule of the Roman Severan dynasty. It was during the Severan reign that the fall of the Roman Empire began. These emperors laid the foundations of the future bureaucratic, military and monarchy, which replaced the Roman Republic. The horseman is a symbol of substituting the polytheism of antiquity for the cult of one image, one cult, one emperor. Ah, uh, now these votive tablets, they're found all over the Roman Empire from Britain to Syria. But here, archaeologists found massive numbers of them in a very limited area, which means the cult originated here. Serdica had enormous importance for the development of Christianity. The St. Sophia Church is one of the most significant temples in the city. The Church of St. Sophia is almost contemporary to the Church of St. George, younger by no more than about 40 years. In fact, bits of mosaic found inside date back to the middle of the 4th century. In 343 AD, 318 bishops convened here during the Serdica Council. For a while, Serdica was the spiritual capital of the world. You know, there are not many places in the world where there are so many saints gathered together. Come on, let me show you. So, Father, what did the Serdica Council mean to the development of Christianity? The initial intention was to hold an ecumenical council here where the hostile bishops of the East and the West would reconcile. But it didn't happen that way. During the Serdica Council, the first version of the Nicene Creed was ratified. The construction of the church lasted 1,600 years. Today's appearance dates back to the rule of Justinian the Great.
The last emperor to rule over the whole of the Roman Empire. I believe there is a crypt below, and I've heard that archaeologists keep uncovering new sepulchres and catacombs. During the Serdica Council, the bishops exculpated Saint Athanasius the Great, who had previously been dethroned as Bishop of Alexandria. Most probably the church was initially intended as a cemetery, but during the Second Bulgarian Kingdom it received the status of a bishop's cathedral. With respect to architecture, it resembles the Saint Alexander Nevsky Cathedral. Which is where we're going next. The largest Orthodox church on the Balkan Peninsula, St. Alexander Nevsky, is the Patriarchal Cathedral of the Bulgarians. It was designed by a Russian architect, but it looks nothing like a Russian church. After the liberation of Bulgaria from the Ottoman rule, there was a call in Sofia for the return to the Byzantine legacy. The Nevsky Cathedral was constructed in a Neo-Byzantian style. The central dome and the bell tower dome are slated with pure gold. A rich collection of priceless icons are kept in the crypt. The cathedral itself is constructed with extremely expensive materials of the highest quality, Italian marble, onyx from Brazil and alabaster. So the, uh, the dome here is 45 meters high and if you look around the side you can see that the gold lettering is actually the Lord's Prayer. Mm. Yeah. And it's possible to have up to 5,000 people gathered in this space. And here is the Bulgarian Tsar's thrones and this one is the Patriarch's throne over here. It is interesting to know that no Bulgarian monarch has ever used the thrones, although Bulgaria has had three Tsars in its modern history. The first one, Ferdinand, was the grandson of the last French king, Louis-Philippe. It was during Ferdinand's rule that the cathedral was built. He was forced to abdicate after World War I, and the church was inaugurated two years later. Ferdinand's son, Boris III, would rather stand before the thrones, and the last Bulgarian Tsar, Simeon II, was a minor when the communists forced him out of the country. The church choir of Alexander Nevsky was where Boris Christos' amazing career started. He is often called the greatest basso profundo of the second half of the 20th century. The bell tower is 53 meters high. There are 12 bells altogether, the largest weighing 12 tons and the smallest 10 kilograms. The bell's combined weight is 23 tons. They were cast in Moscow and later transported to Bulgaria. From here you can see all of downtown Sofia. The parliament, the monument of the Russian emperor Alexander II, who led the Russian troops during the war for liberation of Bulgaria. The Bulgarian Academy of Science. Further, you can see the domes of the Black Mosque which is now the Sveti Sedmochislenitsi Church. The majority of the old churches in Sofia functioned as mosques during the Ottoman period. Sveti Sedmochislenitsi, however, was built as a mosque and was converted into an Orthodox church as late as the beginning of the 20th century. Excavations uncovered remains of an Asclepius temple from the Roman times. Remnants of an early Christian church were also uncovered in the foundations. Later, the Turks built their mosque on top of them. They left it when they lost Sofia. For a while, the building was used as a prison, leading to its colloquial name, the Black Mosque. So here, in Boyana Church, there are Bulgaria's most famous frescoes. The church, which is unique in Europe, was constructed at three separate stages in the 10th, 13th and 19th centuries. At different points it was a family chapel and the tomb of a local ruler. 
In the 13th century, Sebastian Krator Kolyan and his wife Desislava expanded the existing church and had it decorated with frescoes. Today you can see their portraits and those of Tsar Konstantin Tichy and his wife Irene on the walls of the church. Art historians claim that the Boyana church frescoes are portents of the European Renaissance. They are the first church frescoes in Europe that broke the canon and introduced realism in the depiction of people. They were painted ten years before the birth of Giotto, the famous pre-Renaissance master. Well, we're going to the peak of Vitosha and it's called Czerny Vruk and it's the same height as Mount Olympus. All European capitals are either by the sea or have a river running through them. Sofia is unique because it's situated at the foot of a mountain, Vitosha. It reminds me a lot about the Holman Colin in Oslo, but this is much bigger. <laughs> now this hut here is called an Aleko. It's actually named after the famous Bulgarian writer Aleko Konstantinov. And he was the man responsible for starting organized tourism here in Bulgaria at the end of the 19th century. The Alpine style of the hut's architecture is no accident. Many of the Bulgarian intellectuals studied at the most prestigious universities in Switzerland, France, Austria and Germany. On their return to Bulgaria, they wanted to transfer the spirit of Western Europe here. This is visible in the appearance of Sofia at the beginning of the 20th century. The architects were from Austria, Germany, France and Italy at first, then later Bulgarians. They created the unique look of the city, especially the combination with the Byzantine shapes of the Orthodox churches. This impressive building was the state printing house at the beginning of the 19th century. Today it's the Museum for Foreign Art and it holds one of the richest collections of traditional Indian work, one of the largest in Europe. The military club was one of the most imposing buildings in Sofia before World War II. It was a place where officers gathered together, where they brought their wives or companions and grand Vienna balls were organized here. In the 1930s, the legendary Russian opera singer Fyodor Shalyapin sang on the stage of the Grand Hall. But speaking of opera, Raina Kabayevanska and Nikolai Gayurov's international careers also started in Sofia. The Bulgarian Academy of Science, an elegant building for the guardians of knowledge. The academy is older than the modern Bulgarian state. It was established in 1869 not as a result of the whim of a monarch, the usual case in Europe, but by a group of enthusiasts from the sciences and arts. Sofia University, St. Clement Okritsky, is the oldest higher education institution in Bulgaria. The first professors here were foreigners, mainly Czechs and Austrians, invited here by the Prince Regent Ferdinand. After the October Revolution in Russia, a new wave of professors was invited here, this time mainly white guard emigrants. The university has always been the centre of opposition. The students here were the most vehement anti-monarchists. During the communist era, this was the only place where opponents of the regime congregated and worked. The building was erected thanks to the financial donation of two brothers whose monuments are seen by the main entrance. Evlogi and Christo Georgiev were rich merchants, millionaires who lived in Romania. Unique new Byzantine style of some of public buildings in the center of the Sofia is a an excellent example of combining modernity with the legacy of the antiquity and the Middle Age. The baths, the market hall, the building of Holy Synod, 
and Alexandrovska University Hospital is a brilliant example of the revival of architectural tradition. 450 years after the fall of Constantinople, a vanished empire was rebuilt not as political entity, but in spirit. The majority of these buildings were designed by the distinguished Bulgarian architect Petko Momchilov. Only 28 years old, he won a competition against Gustav Eiffel. The project for a bridge in Budapest was later commissioned to Eiffel, but the outcome of the competition was nonetheless an indisputable recognition of the young Bulgarian. In the very heart of Sofia is the so-called Square of Tolerance, Within less than 300 meters, you can see temples from four of the world's major religions. Across the street from the market hall is the Banyabashi Mosque. It was built in the 16th century and was designed by the prominent Ottoman architect Nimar Sinan, the architect of the famous Selimiye Mosque in Odrin and the Suleiman Mosque in Istanbul. This is the Sophia Synagogue. It's the third largest in Europe, after the ones in Budapest and Amsterdam. It was built using the design of the Vienna Synagogue. Unfortunately, the original temple was destroyed by Nazi troops. The Catholic Cathedral of St. Joseph. It's a new building, but it's located in the place of the old cathedral, which was destroyed during the World War II bombings. Pope John Paul II personally laid the cornerstone of the new cathedral in 2002. The remains of the canonized Serbian king Stefan Milutin are kept in the Orthodox Sveti Nedelia church. The body of the saint is preserved intact and every year the priests of the church dress him in a new set of clothes. They cut the old clothes into little pieces and give them to the believers as sacramentals. Sophia remained Roman even after the fall of Rome, Byzantine after the fall of the Byzantine Empire. The city preserved the spirit of the vanished civilizations, even after the metropolises were gone, after the empires were no more. The Church of Saint Sophia in Istanbul was turned into a mosque. The descendants of the ancient Hellenas and Romans in Constantinople were gradually assimilated by the aggressive Ottoman culture, but Saint Sophia was preserved here. The people here adapted more easily. They retained the legacies from antiquity in the Middle Ages and managed to extract the best from every conqueror. And this continued for over 3,000 years. The city never ceased thriving, even for a day. Its progress was never interrupted. Rome has two histories, as Rome of the Caesars and Rome of the Popes. Constantinople was once the capital of the Vasilius, later of the Sultans, without any continuity between them. Sofia, on the other hand, is at the same time a city of Thracians, of Caesars, of Vasilius, of Sultans, of Tsars, and of the modern world. Everyone leaves their mark here building upon the previous heritage without destroying it. This is the National Theatre. It's one of the most brilliant examples of European architecture. It was designed by Austrian architects and it's been thoroughly reconstructed twice. You know, it looked quite similar to the theatres in Zagreb and Glass. That's right. The Viennese architects, Fellmer and Helmer, they created some of the most impressive operas and theatre houses in the whole of Central Europe. Come on, let me introduce you to my colleague. Yeah. There are over 10 theatres in Sofia. In Theatre and Film Academy, we study Stanislavski system, but we often break the canon. At the inauguration of the National Theatre in 1907, a group of rebellious students booed Prince Ferdinand. As a result, the government was overthrown and the university was closed for a year. 
Now for something more recent. The National Palace of Culture is really impressive with its proportions and potential to host various events. More steel was used for its construction than for the Eiffel Tower. The palace has 13 halls and the largest one, Hall 1, has 5,000 seats and excellent acoustics. The National Palace of Culture was erected for the commemoration of the 1300th anniversary of the founding of the Bulgarian state. Sofia's motto is growing without aging and it is quite true. Even as a spiritual capital of the old world, Sofia is not old, it is ancient which is quite different. In an area of several square kilometers, the whole of Europe is represented and the whole of European history from antiquity to the present day. In less than an hour, you can experience all the stages of its history. The journey from Rome to Constantinople, which took centuries in time and thousands of kilometers in distance, can be covered in minutes within Sofia. Go ahead and try it.